in the case of a covalent compound, you're going to have the sharing of electrons between two or more nonmetals. And in here, we have an example of hydrogen, H2, which is really a molecular element more than a covalent compound, but the idea is the same. And it turns out that there's a great or a ideal distance for the two nuclei to be. So note what you have here. You have two positively charged nuclei, and you have these negatively charged electron clouds. And if you get these two positively charged nuclei too close to each other, like over here, that's not energetically favorable because you have these repulsive forces. On the other hand, if you get these uh, neg uh, positively charged nuclei too far away from the electrons of the other atom, that's not favorable either. So again, you have higher energy. So there's kind of like this perfect distance in the middle here where the nuclei are as far, are far apart enough to be happy, but they're close enough to the electrons of the other atom to be happy. In the case of hydrogen, the electrons are shared evenly because one hydrogen is exactly like another hydrogen. But not all I, um, covalent compounds work that way. And there's this thing called electronegativity. And electronegativity increases as a trend on the periodic table, like we looked at in previous sections, up and to the right. And so basically, fluorine is the most electronegative atom, and oxygen is the second most electronegative atom, followed by chlorine. And electronegativity is kind of like um, how much the atom likes electrons. So fluorine likes electrons more than it likes oxygen. So in covalent compounds, there's a sharing of electrons, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the sharing is equal. So the electrons will spend the same amount of time around one atom as another. When it's two hydrogen atoms, the sharing is equal because the hydrogen atoms are the same and they have the same electronegativity. If we could think of this as an example of putting two kids in a room full of toys, and I know these pictures are not perfect. If you put two kids in a room full of toys, they're expected to share the toys. However, if one kid really likes toys, if you come back a little while later, that kid may be completely, completely surrounded by toys and this would be their view. While another kid is happy with one toy, and you can see this kid is just playing with this one toy, and they're perfectly content. So although the kids are technically sharing all the toys in the room, they're not sharing them equally. One kid's with playing with 90% of the toys, and another kid is just happy with their one toy. It's the same thing in electronegativity. Although the two atoms may be sharing the electron density, it doesn't mean they're sharing it necessarily equal. So this kid is like the electronegative kid because he likes the toys more, atoms like electron density more, and this kid is more like the less electronegative kid because they're happy with the one toy and some atoms like electron density less. So if we look at this in the example of hydrogen and chloride, Hi, uh, chlorine is here, hydrogen's over here. Hydrogen, um, if you think about it on the electronegativity scale, is a little bit less than that of carbon. So it's something like here. So fluorine is here, chlorine's right below it. The noble gases do not have electronegativities. That's why I lined this off here because they don't form covalent bonds very often. So basically what we have is hydrogen here, chlorine here. Chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen it's closer to fluorine, so therefore it's more electronegative. So this is not an even sharing situation. The electron density is gonna spend more time around chlorine and less time around hydrogen. This is called a polar bond. There are two ways in which we can indicate polar bonds. One is by the, well, I guess there are three. One is by this electron density map. And in this case, the green means more electron, uh, more electron density, and the white means less electron density. Sometimes I've seen these uh, scaled as uh, blue and red, but in this case, they're scaled as green and white. Same idea. Another way of doing it is by this symbol. This is not accidentally a plus. This means partially positive, and the electrons are more towards the chlorine. If they're more towards the chlorine, the chlorine is partially negative. And if they're less towards the hydrogen, the hydrogen is partially positive. The third, and probably I would argue the most common way, is this, the, at least that we're gonna use here, 
is this delta plus delta minus. Delta means partially. So what this means is hydrogen is partially positive. Since hydrogen is less electronegative, the electrons are spending less time around it. Since electrons are negatively charged, having less negative charge means more positive charge because it still has a proton, so this is delta plus. The electrons are now spending more time around chlorine, so that means the chlorine has more electron density and therefore a greater uh, negative charge, and we indicate that as delta minus. Please do not get this confused with actual plus and actual minus. This is a covalent compound. The way we can tell that this is a covalent compound is because it's between two nonmetals, a hydrogen and a chlorine. This is covalent. When you have a covalent compound, you can have partial charges. In fact, you often do have partial charges. However, it does not mean that they're actual charges. This is not an ionic compound. This is a sharing of electrons. It's just an unequal sharing of electrons. One other thing that is um, sometimes used is the difference in electronegativity. It turns out you can actually look up the values of electronegativities. I don't even have them here. I just uh, would like you to know this relative trend. But you can look up the um, differences in electronegativities. A pure covalent bond has a difference of an electronegativity of less than 0 0.4. This typically occurs if you have something that's diatomic, like if you have an oxygen bonded to an oxygen. The difference in electronegativity is zero because they're both oxygen, so they both have the same electronegativity. Another case that where this happens, which is important for organic chemistry, is between carbon and carbon, because they're the same atom, and carbon and hydrogen. Organic chemistry is the study of carbon-based chemistry, and many organic molecules contain carbon and hydrogen. In fact, most organic molecules contain a hydro a carbon and hydrogen. These are covalent, and they're not polar. Polar covalent occurs between basically any other two nonmetals. There are exceptions to this, but you, I would say pure covalent is carbon and hydrogen and diatomics. Polar covalent is everything else. So if you have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen or a hydrogen bonded to a chlorine, these are covalent bonds. And it's very important that we talking that we make it clear we are talking about bonds here individual bonds, not molecules. There are different rules that govern the polarity of entire molecules, and we'll cover them at the end of this chapter. But in this case, we're talking about individual bonds. So hydrogen-oxygen bonds, nitrogen-hydrogen bonds, um, carbon bonded to a fluorine, these are all polar covalent bonds. They're covalent because they're nonmetals, two or more nonmetals, and they're polar because there are differences in electronegativity. The only cases where there are no differences of electronegativity, again, are diatomics and hydrocarbons. And then ionic. The electronegativity difference is greater than 1.8. To me, this is largely um, just a different way of looking at an ionic compound. You already know how to identify an ionic compound due to the presence of metal, or technically NH4 plus ammonium, the only positively charged uh, polyatomic ion we've covered in this course. So ionic compounds are between a metal and a nonmetal. To identify them by differences in electronegativity, uh, to me, just seems like a different way of doing something that you already know how to do. So this is um, the difference between pure covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. It's very important to remember that this is the rules for bonds, not for molecules. In fact, this is so important that I will probably discuss this again when we talk about um, polar covalent bonds. In the next section, we want to actually look at some Lewis structures, a little bit for ionic compounds, and then we're going to spend the best part of an hour looking at Lewis structures for covalent compounds. Lewis structures are very important and something that you absolutely need to practice for this course.